If Democrats aren't able to win control of the Senate next month, the party will be doing a lot of reflection over what went wrong in November. One of their top candidates was Maine State House Speaker Sarah Gideon. She led or was tied with Republican Senator Susan Collins in every poll dating back to July. But ultimately, the race was not close. Collins won another six years in her seat by nearly nine percentage points. That was despite the fact that President-elect Joe Biden won the state by about the same margin. Nathan Bernard is a reporter for the Mainer News Cooperative, a worker-owned company that publishes a monthly news and arts magazine. His latest article for their magazine is headlined, How Sarah Gideon Lost to Susan Collins the Day After She Entered the Race. Nathan, welcome. It's a fascinating piece. You pinpoint June 25th, 2019 as the day that doomed the Gideon campaign. Why is that? Well, that was the day that uh, the DSCC endorsed her campaign, and the DSCC endorsement really ended up being the kiss of death for Gideon's campaign, because it meant that instead of listening to the needs of struggling Mainers, the campaign was listening to the advice of elitist DC con DC consultants, which basically guaranteed what the race was. What is the DSCC? Was... It's the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. So sorry to interrupt, but I want to make sure folks know what we're talking about here. This is not a main group. This is a group out of Washington, the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very powerful political organization run by Chuck Schumer. Uh, and, you know, they provide consultants and, you know, all sorts of fundraising raising lists and resources to folks running uh, for U.S. Senate across the country. But I mean, you know, uh, with that endorsement, it really meant that Gideon wasn't going to listen to the struggling Mainers. Instead, you know, they are taking advice from, advice from these DC consultants, which unfortunately guaranteed the race was obscenely expensive. Uh, Gideon actually spent twice as much as uh, Collins did, despite losing. And most of the money went to negative advertising, which made the race really, really ugly, especially during the COVID pandemic, when people are dying of starvation, they're getting evicted, the homeless population has skyrocketed here, and the campaign was still spending tens of millions of dollars on negative ads, as well as pushing out emails literally begging folks to send Gideon's campaign more money instead of helping suffering Mainers. So, I mean, the cynicism and the constant negativity really backfired and turned people off. But most importantly, the D.C. consultants running Gideon's campaign were just totally out of touch with local concerns. Every organizer, activist, and the other candidates I spoke with were telling me that jobs and the economy, those were top issues for voters here. And jobs, I mean, you know, that they can put food on the table now, that they can find work now, that they can put a roof over their head right now. Economy meaning that Folks want good work in the future for their children, for their grandchildren. They want their kids to live a dignified life and have a better life than they did. So really, really human stuff. But again, instead of listening to voters, Gideon's campaign listened to the D.C. elite and the words jobs and economy. They weren't even mentioned once in the over 23,000 Facebook ads that the campaign ran. So it was just a real disaster for the DSCC, unfortunately. And I think, you know, proof that big money can't buy campaigns and Fancy consultants don't win races. Yeah, so on this point of the money, this was the most expensive race in Maine's history. Gideon spent nearly $60 million, twice as much as the Collins campaign. And despite that huge fundraising advantage, you report that Gideon was begging for donations on the afternoon of Election Day, even though they had millions of dollars still in the bank. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, really grim stuff. Uh, well, I mean, I think that's what D.C. political consultants are best at, raising and spending money. And their incentive is to make as much money as possible, not necessarily win elections and definitely not to make people's lives better. So, for instance, I mean, ad buying consultants typically get a 20 percent commission on the total ad spend. So the more money they spend, the more money they make. And that means that they try to blanket the airwaves with ads. And, you know, here in Maine, that certainly happened. It was wall-to-wall -wall campaign ads. Again, like I said, they were largely negative for over a year this was going on. I mean, mm -hmm. Gideon's campaign right now has $15 million left over. Gideon is refusing to talk to the media about it, where that money is going. 
which I think just speaks to the cruelty of this campaign and just kind of these races in general. I mean, we have a nor'easter storm happening here today. We're literally getting feet right. of snow outside, and thousands of people are homeless. People are freezing to death on the streets across the state during this storm, and even more are starving and need food. Despite all of this, Gideon's campaign and the Democratic Party are still hoarding almost $15 million while people are literally dying. So it's just really cruel and wrong. Uh, and I hope, like, you know, a lot of other people here that live here in Maine, like, we all hope that Gideon gives the money to help feed and house and give medical care to Mainers in need, because that sort of money, that can go so far in Maine. It can do so much. Just it could, it could literally buy six million meals, for instance. So, yeah, I mean, we're hoping for the best. But, um, you know, that's just the name of the game. They raise and spend money, D.C. consultants. Well, we're certainly thinking of you and your fellow Mainers there and hoping that you all get through that storm okay. Um, I want to ask you about sort of the nationalization of the race, because we saw this in other places. But Senator Collins, as you know, walks this fine line sometimes of bucking President Trump, but then often ultimately backing him. And that is something that Sarah Gideon hammered Senator Collins on. Why do you think, though, that that particular kind of navigation that Senator Collins has engaged in worked for her in Maine? Well, I think that, you know, people here have known Susan Collins for 30 years, right? And they kind of, they already have an image portrayed of her. So portraying her as this person that is just a Trump lackey and always votes with Trump and will follow McConnell, I mean, that's not like making McConnell's life worse or making Trump's life worse. That's not telling me as someone living in Maine, let's say, like how that's going to make my life better. So if they listen to voters, mm -hmm. if they listen to grassroots organizers instead of the D.C. elite, they would have really heard how people are suffering and responded directly to that. And people need work. People need homes. People need food. People need health care. And if the Gideon campaign really listens, they also would have heard on overwhelming, you know, an overwhelming message that people think the government is completely useless. And you know, Susan Collins is a part of that, of course. But people believe that right now the government cannot and will not make their lives better in any way. And it seems that if they had a plan and a message, the Democrats did, and I'm a Democrat, right? Like if they had a plan and a message about creating good paying jobs for folks, making health care a human right and providing that to people, that would start to shake the idea that government is useless. And I mean, this, this campaign, this race, it didn't go the way that people wanted, obviously. But I think like you can learn a lot from it. And this all means that there's a chance to build a new type of politics. And that's based, you know, in local issues led by the needs of working people and is really grassroots in its origins. And I don't know. I think that's uh, pretty optimistic and exciting. All right. Nathan Bernard with the Mainer News Cooperative. Nathan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for picking up the story and uh, giving local news a platform. I really appreciate it.